Good morning and welcome to Bonita's House Call here on the SABC2. Babanta Ram Chogan Randa, Sodom Yamantala Sumshop, Skulegi de Kaya. I'm Dr. Victor Ramatisi. E. Nenang Luk Sitang Naka Katu. Little one has Saturday and Sesson Assessing, which is Nala Mashumara Road for the Little Hora, Yabro de Duce. Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me this morning to please introduce to you Professor Tim Noakes, accompanied by Dr. Gail Ashford, specialist and family physician. Now, he's one of South Africa's foremost scientists who has made it his business to challenge long-held beliefs and practices in the world of medicine. It has been a source of irritation for many authorities, only for them to finally agree with him after many years of acrimony and disagreement. But now he has introduced the Noakes diet. And many are saying, this time, he has gone too far. You be the judge. Flying economy back to Cape Town. And he overlaps into the other seat. And next to him is a lovely old lady. And she starts tweeting or something that this man is grossly obese and he's in my space and I'm having a terrible flight. And he, the guy gets so embarrassed that he gets in his car and he drives to his general practitioner and arrives there late in the afternoon. And she says to him, you've got high blood pressure and you've got diabetes. I must hospitalize you now because you're going to die before tomorrow morning, you see? <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so he says, no, give me six months. I'm going home and I'm going to find the solution. So he goes on the internet and very quickly he discovers the so-called Noakes diet. And he says, that's it, I'm trying the Noakes diet. Okay, now, now this very important point. He got his information off the internet. He did not consult the doctor, and he did everything himself. And that's the future, ladies and gentlemen, of medicine. Medicine is in real trouble, because either you cure this guy or you don't. And if you don't, he will find someone who will cure him. And that's the future of medicine with the internet. D do you think he hasn't tried to lose weight? I'll give you another example later. But so he goes away, and seven months later, he loses 80 kilograms by himself, by himself. Okay, now did I kill this patient? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in other words, we must put him back on the healthy diet he was eating and make him lose, gain the 80 kilograms. Okay, now he has no diabetes, he has no high blood pressure, and he says, thank you, Dr. Noakes, for saving my life. Now, if I can cure one more person of morbid obesity, the only medical treatment known for this guy is gastric bypass surgery. That's what medicine does. And I cured this guy without ever seeing him, without ever consulting him. If I can do it for one person, I can do it for two. If I can do it for two, I can do it for four. If I can do it for four, I can do it for 16. If I can do it for 16, I can do it for everyone in the world. Okay. Because I understand what the condition is. And this is called food addiction. And I'm going to show it to you now. It's food addiction. That's what causes obesity. And you never hear it. They never talk about it. But that's the cause. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Tim Nooks, welcome this morning, Dr. Gail Ashford. Thank you very much for coming in this morning. I mean, we, don't, we, we actually have one hour to achieve what can reasonably be done in five hours. But let, 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 let's make a start. Now, I, I was there representing House Call in December 2011, when there was an academic debate, if you wish, between Professor Tim Noakes, who had just lost X number of kilograms after starting on the Noakes diet, and the Professor Jacques Rousseau, who came out of the US, who holds all of those conventional and long-held beliefs. What has changed in the last three years? Because we are lambasted in that particular conference with people coming hammer and tongs from all angles to say, you can't take a personal experience and want to make you know, a, a generalized statement and want to encourage people to follow your Well, the reality is that the evidence has been so completely suppressed. So I didn't know that information in, through my education. And I, I read a lot. And I'm in the sports sciences. And I should know a bit about nutrition. And I didn't know all the evidence there was that this high-fat diet is healthy, or conversely, that there's no evidence that the low-fat diet is, is of no value to you. Because that information has been so suppressed by so many different influences, and most particularly at medical schools by the pharmaceutical industry. Because they are dependent on this cholesterol causes heart disease model to sustain the cholesterol-lowering drugs, the statin drugs. 
which is a $40 billion a year industry. Big, big, the highest selling yeah. drug in the world today is a statin, yeah. is a cholesterol and, drug. And one might add, it's also probably the most ineffective drug that has ever been prescribed oh, for a, oh, oh, for oh, a oh, major illness. <laughs> But, but the evidence yes, is yeah. all there, but one has to find it. And the point is that once you get into groupthink, when everyone is told the same thing and they're all educated the same way, there's mm. absolutely no benefit for jumping a, a, away from it. Mm. And so for 33 years, I followed this diet. I ate no fat, and all that happened to me was I got fat and I got type 2 diabetes. And I continued to exercise. So I did everything right, as my colleagues told me, and I got type 2 diabetes. And I sat to ask the question, why? And the answer was, wrong, bad genes and eating too much carbohydrate. And then I started reading and seeing how much evidence there is to support that interpretation. That it's carbohydrates that are killing us, not fat. And that as soon as we took fat out the diet, we really got into trouble. Mm -hmm. Now, th at that debate, I was debating a man who spent $700 million of tax money from the United States of America to prove that a low-fat diet didn't work. But he won't go out and say it. And what's more, as I proved in that debate, which was shunned because of the group think of the person who was running the debate and who would not open his mind, the, I, was, I indicated to them that if you had heart disease and you ate this low-fat diet, you did worse on Dr. Rousseau's data. It showed it. But he mm. never, they never exposed it. And, I asked, and eventually when I tackled him through the South African Medical Journal, he said, because there's no known mechanism by which a low-fat diet can cause heart disease. There are tons of mechanisms by which low-fat diets cause heart disease because they're high in carbohydrates. And if you're insulin resistant and eat a high-carbohydrate diet, you're exposed to high insulin concentrations repeatedly, and it's the insulin concentrations which activate all the diseases, mechanisms causing heart disease. Dr. Ashford, why has this book sold 120,000 copies and and, and still going strong. Why, in your view, has been the reason for that? Because this is the book that promotes this low carbohydrate, high fat diet that you're talking about. Well, you say three years ago, nobody had heard of this in South Africa. And I think it must be stressed, this has been around. Um, and, and Prof Noakes has brought it to us here in South Africa, and there really is a revolution here. And a year and a half ago, two years, when I started to uh, practice openly as a low carbohydrate, high fat doctor and, and align myself with Prof Noakes, I didn't have any patients. I would talk to my own patients in my practice and they'd say, what is this? What, this is bizarre. Mm -hmm. Now I'm seeing two, three patients a day who are seeking me out to come and, and, and seek advice about this kind of diet. So there has been an absolute revolution within the medical field. And I think it's just simple that people will adopt something that works. And, and, and the truth of the matter is, is, is people are not, they're not fools. You can fool them for so long. And most people will try a diet. They will follow the magazine shows and, and read a magazine. They will go and see a dietitian. They will ask their doctor. They will buy a book. But if it doesn't work, they will stop and they will seek something else. But, but, but Professor Noakes, you, you were told that if you want everybody to believe what you're saying, you must go and conduct further research. But you refuse and said, but I, I, I don't have to go and conduct further research. Research has been done as, as, as long ago as in 1862 when <laughs> William Bunting and William Heber said, I don't have to go and do the, the research has already been done. The reali reality, Victor, is that there is no proper interven dietary intervention that has ever been done. It is impossible. Mm. To do a proper dietary intervention, you have to put people in a jail mm. and control everything they do for 24 hours a day. I see. And you can't do it. So the U.S. government and their funders decided in about the 1960s that they would take second-class evidence. Okay. 
and that is that they would tell people what to do and they would assume that they did they it. They have done it. Yeah. Because you can't control it like exactly. in, a, in a proper clinical trial. Exactly. Because so there are so many variables that you cannot precisely. control unless you put those people precisely. in the institution. Precisely. If you're going to yeah. follow people for 10 years, mm. some of them are going to start smoking, some are going to start exercising. How do you control And when they die, you don't know exactly what killed them. Precisely. Yeah. I see. And that's the problem. So now people want me to do a clinical trial that is impossible. I see. And, it would, and why? Because it would cost two, three, four, five billion dollars. Mm. And my point is that if you understand the biology of the system, you can see what carbohydrates to do that to, to that system, and you can see what fats do to that system. And there are clinical trials lasting two years, which clearly show that if you're insulin resistant and you get your carbohydrate intake below 50 grams a day, you will benefit more on the high fat diet than on the high carbohydrate. We'll come back to this. We'll come back. But, but please, now let, 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 let us get this straight. We are all taught that if you eat calories, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm not saying carbohydrates specifically because calories can come yeah, from sure. fat and they can come. If you, can build, if you eat calories that, that are designed to provide energy to mm -hmm. the body, and your biggest source is carbohydrates and less so fat and less so proteins, if you eat more than what your body needs for your body to conduct its daily functions, the body through a very complex mechanism will store those calories for a rainy day. And it will do it in a form of fat. Mm -hmm. So if you starve yourself or you exercise a little bit more later and, and, and there isn't enough energy that is coming through, the body will begin to use the stores and therefore that you'll begin to lose mm. that fat. Mm. What has changed? I think there's two concepts that need to be separated out. Mm. The first is that you do need to create an energy deficit. Mm. You need to eat less. Mm. And that, that is the fundamental. And that won't put your life in danger in any sense. No, I mean all diets, mm. every diet, anybody who burns more calories yes. than they you take in will, will lose weight. Yes. But the difference is, is that the calories are not equal the kilojoules are not equal and this is where people get confused so if you are consuming uh, the calories from from a chocolate milk that we are giving our children in their lunchbox versus the calories from biltong those are going to be processed metabolized differently. and burned differently okay so the calories from fat and and meat and the calories from the processed sugars and carbohydrates that we're eating are very different. I see. Okay. And so though that's now, where it I comes different. I needed to different. clear that before I go to the end break because when you come back we're going to run at a faster speed. So in other words, this theory that I'm, I'm putting out there has not changed. What has, what has become more understood is that it depends on the source of your calories. And secondly, it depends on whether you are carbohydrate resistant or not. And that is where the question lies. Anyway, we'll leave it at that point. But I will say, I will go for tomorrow. I will go and I will say, I will go and I will say, I will go and I will go and we'll continue our discussion on the NOGS diet and focus more on the key rules of nutrition guiding this diet. Hang on, I will go and I will go and I will go and I will go. I'll take it segment three. I've got a lot to cover in this segment. Yeah. We're talking about exercise, we're talking about nutrition, but mainly about nutrition to the prof. Let's go straight to the rules that you outline in your book that is called The Real Meal Revolution. Number one, it says interest determines what we believe about nutrition. What do you mean by that? We've been Unfortunately, the sorry, should you, can we do that one again? Sorry, yeah. Industry determines Industry, what yeah, we believe right, yeah. about nutrition. Yeah. yeah, industry's job is to sell their product, and that's they have to do it whatever way they can, and they have made sure that we believe that carbohydrates are incredibly healthy and fat is unhealthy. And what do you mean by industry? 
all the, all the industries that are providing food, but particularly the processed food industry, mm. they decided in the 1970s, when fat had to be removed from the diet to put sugar in its place, mm. they soon learned that they could make these foods absolutely addictive. So at some point, fat was removed from diet and sugar was put in its place? Absolutely. To achieve what exactly? Because you have to have taste. And if you take fat out of food, it tastes like cardboard. Oh. So they had to put sugar in. And then they very quickly learned that sugar has addictive processes. Because at that point, fat was seen to be the major culprit for, for a lot of heart disease That's and correct. others. In, in a, incorrectly, without any evidence whatsoever. Sure. So somebody at some point in their intelligence, they saw it fit to remove fat from diet. And because food became very bland after, so they added sugar to yeah. give it taste. And that sugar is what is causing us the obesity Absolutely. explosion that yeah. we are seeing today. There's a thing called the bliss point. Now, the industry selects every food that item that you can see in the cafeteria that you go by has been through testing for its bliss point. And the bliss point is the combination of salt, sugar, and fat mm. that makes it absolutely irresistible mm. to you. Every food is like that. That's chocolate milk. Yeah. Well, yeah, now, now talking about that, I, I must ask a lady about this, <laughs> if, you, if you allow me. So, just say like chocolates, they have, they have, they have a significant bliss point. So the higher the bliss point, the more tasteful and the more addictive is the food. Mm. That's correct. I mean, there are people who are employed by Cadbury's and Nestle and, and all of the food industry to specifically engineer the exact amount and the exact nature to get the right addictive potential of the food, and I mean this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but if you read Michael Moss's book, Sugar, Salt, Fat, mm. it, it's explained there. Okay. And, and they engineer the right amount to make sure that you go back and buy that product. But then my Again. problem is, these are the same people who will sponsor your various associations that are related to, that, are supposed to, develop, <laughs> that, are, that are supposed to develop the, the guidelines to guide. These are the people who will sponsor the Heart Foundation and such organizations. So do, do, do you mean to say, I mean, they put money into this process and somehow influence the thinking and we, the mere mortals, are taking all of this information, not knowing that Absolutely. there are profit, profit motives behind them? My greatest friend is funded by Coca-Cola. To make one statement that physical exercise is what lack of physical activity is causing obesity. That's all that happens. Coca but that's true, is it not? No, it's not at all true. Lack of physical activity no. causes obesity, bro. No. One. Physical thing. activity has got nothing to do with weight loss at okay. all. Let, let's hold it there. <laughs> now, 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 you're talking about processed food, processed food, processed food. Now, what is processed food? The simplest way to think of it is if you walk into your supermarket, mm. you have your fresh food mm. on the one side, your fresh meat, fresh dairy, fresh veg, uh, fresh fish and poultry. And then you have your rows and rows of shelves, which has got boxes and packaged food. And essentially, if you look at those expiry dates, those are expiry dates which are three, four months time. That's processed food. Anything that's going to last on your shelf for two, three, four months or a year or two means that they've added preservatives or sugar, uh, salt, fat, something in it to make it last a long time. And it is that that causes obesity in your view? Those are certainly yeah. Rule number two, major Prof. That's we run out of time. Rule number two says it is not only about calories. It's about fat and about appetite. What yeah. About so what Gail said was absolutely correct about the calories being different, but they also have effect, different effects on the brain. And insulin secretion probably has some role. And so the more insulin you secrete and the higher your glucose goes, the more you stimulate your appetite. Whereas eating fat and protein, keeping insulin low, seems to delay, well, sorry, it does delay your, your hunger. So we, it's a simple test. Just give your children eggs and bacon for breakfast and they will get hungry at two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Give them cereals and grains, they will be hungry at 10 o'clock in the morning mm. and they will need to eat more carbohydrate. And that effect has been known since 1970. So when we changed the guidelines and said, eat more carbohydrate, the unintended consequence was that we increased our calorie consumption, and that has happened across the board. So, so to get to the, the same effect from calories, eat more fat because the fat, the body will utilize it much better and is not going to store it as easily as it does mm -hmm. your simple yeah. sugars. No, no, you, you, you store fat from carbohydrate. You see, that's the key. Mm. The excess carbohydrate has to go to fat. Carbohydrate has only two functions. You either burn it, immediately within the next 24 hours, or you store it as fat, that's all. That's all, it has no other role. You can Rule number three, there are two types of humans, those who are carbohydrate tolerant and those who are carbohydrate resistant. And I think this is where the whole Noakes diet, because you still, to keep talking about yeah. carbohydrate resistant, 
What does this mean exactly? In that debate we spoke about, mm. the other professor said insulin resistance is so uncommon we can ignore it. Mm. Mm. In America today, there are 30 million people with type, one, type 2 diabetes, meaning they're insulin resistant. There are another 83, with pre 83 million with prediabetes. That means 37%. They're insulin resistant, but they're not diabetic just yet. They, but they will be in tomorrow mm. or the next day. That means 37% of Americans have already been clinically diagnosed as insulin resistant. And that's not even before we went and tested the ones who are supposedly healthy. But what does it mean to be insulin resistant? Insulin resistant means when you take in carbohydrate, mm. you can't store it and metabolize it normally. And your body has to over-secrete insulin. Mm. And that turns all that carbohydrate into fat. That's essentially what happens. I see. So you take in the carbs, but they turn into fat. But the process of over-secreting insulin activates an array of abnormalities mm. which lead to chronic disease. So how do you know if you're insulin resistant? There's a few, few things. If you're carrying extra weight, uh, particularly around the middle, mm. that's often a very good predictor of insulin resistance. If you're finding that you have energy crashes, so you've eaten breakfast and around mid-morning or mid-afternoon after lunch or evening, you find that you literally want to put your head down and sleep, that would be a predictor. If you're quite moody or, or irritable, perhaps ask your spouse. Um, if you find that you are having erratic sleep patterns, either that you can't sleep properly, some people find that they are oversleeping, those, that would also be a, a predictor. And if you're getting cravings, cravings for either sweet foods or starchy foods would also be a predictor. And hunger. So insulin resistance, because you've got high levels of insulin, yeah. insulin is signaling hunger. So people who are insulin re resistant are hungry all the time. Can you measure it? Yes, you can. How do you, how do, you do that? Uh, you need to do fasting blood tests, mm. you do a fasting glucose, mm. and you need to do a fasting insulin. Okay. And then you relate the two to each other, which is either using a quick index or a HOMA index. But you can also do HbA1c, which is a test that, that, that you do in the... In That's in correct. The, yeah. uh, Gail's point would be that the HbA1c becomes abnormal later. Mm. Those first changes occur in fasting much insulin. A, much yeah. And yeah. so if you want to check in your children, you would go for the fasting insulin. You wouldn't go for the hba Do you want to suggest that every South African watching this show and those who listen to those who watch this show must go out there and do those tests and determine if they are insulin resistant? Because if they are, they need to start changing the way they eat their food. Absolutely. Even if they may not be obese right now. Exactly. Yeah. It could be the single most important thing we could do for South African's health. Yeah. Diabetes is utterly preventable. If you know your HbA1c and you treat it appropriately by cutting your carbohydrate intake, you will not develop diabetes. Number four, it is not a carbohydrate. Uh, it is a carbohydrate and not the fat in the diet that maintains the obese state, leading to diabetes in those people who are carbohydrate Absolutely, resistant. because the carbohydrates stimulate the overconsumption of calories and you're always hungry. And so exactly as Gail described, that's what happens. Yeah. Number five, he says, there is no definitive evidence that a high fat intake is detrimental to your health. Yeah, now, there's not now we've all been brought up to think that you take, you take a lot of fat, fatty food, it leads to high fat in, in your blood, and the high fat in your blood in, combined with cholesterol would block your blood vessels, and then you'll get kidney failure, or you'll get heart attack, or you'll get a stroke. Now, do you mean that has changed? The, you've, you've made four points there. The model concludes four points. Not one of them has ever been proven. Yeah. So, for example... How does information that, that is pretty much inaccurate or, or that has not been proven anywhere get into the public space and even into our medical textbooks. Your old book, The Law of Running, says some of these things that I'm quoting today. We, we use the word groupthink. Unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry runs what's taught at medical schools. So that, the only <sighs> reason I can say this yeah. is because I'm not a professor of cardiology or of medicine. Mm. If I were, the, the, I, the pharmaceutical industry would withdraw their funding for me. Whatever support they gave me in any form would, would Don't take you to overseas trips to conferences. No more of that. And then <laughs> all the things that the extra money that you need to oh run an apartment boy. disappears. Oh, boy. Now, it says sugar and not fat is the single most toxic ingredient in modern diet. Now, what do you mean by sugar? Because we talk about carbohydrates. We talk about refined food. We talk about processed food. Now, when you say sugar, what do you mean exactly? Because it seems to be the most, 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 most toxic, according to the rules. 
ingredient in our food today. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I might disagree with you there, but that's because there's trans fat. Yeah. There's industrial trans yeah. fat, but yeah. that, that we can We're going to we talk about debate. that a little bit later. Yes, later on. okay. Yeah. Because but I think trans fat is more, is, is more hectic than sugar, okay? Yeah, yeah. Mm. but I think there you can get everyone to agree, even Prof Jacques Rousseau. And, but what I mean by sugar? Is it the one that I heap yes. and put onto my tea, or does well, it come in different forms? It comes in many, many forms. Mm. So, I mean, you've got glucose, so sucrose, fructose. Yeah. And, and glu we're talking about the sugars that are included in foods. And I think what most people don't realize is that when you buy a product that says it's low fat, mm. it means that it automatically has got added sugar. Ish. Ah, no, that's so, so it means if you don't want sugar, you mustn't touch anything that is low fat. Now, yes. yeah, low fat means it's unhealthy. It's mm. a sign that it's unhealthy and you must avoid it. It oh means no. it's been chemically modified. Oh no. Because to retain flavor, they've had to add something else in order to remove fat. And so the sugars are very often hidden. Let's hold it there. We'll continue with this, Rose. We'll, when we return, we'll continue our discussion on the NOX diet and also seek some advice on how should one diagnose it and how should one deal with this dreadful problem of carbohydrate resistance. Welcome back. You're watching Bonita House Corner here on SABC2. And today we dissect the origins and intricacies as well as controversies of the Noakes diet. Now, quickly, Prof, in one of the rules you're saying cholesterol is not the unique cause of heart disease and may not even be an important factor, especially in females. Now, now you, 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 you're going to run into lots of trouble. I said already that the statins or the drugs that reduce cholesterol, I mean, uh, in fact, the, the one, of, one of the highest drugs in the world that is prescribed is actually a statin. Now, you are saying we actually, we may actually not need them because you want to suggest that cholesterol is not an issue that we've all been educated to tell? Not, that the, way, not the way we've been taught. For example, there's a paper out in Journal of American Medical Association three years ago showing in 500,000 people, 72% had normal blood lipid levels. So therefore, how can it be a risk factor if 72% have a normal value? A, a normal value becomes a risk factor, not an abnormal value. Mm -hmm. But we're not taught that. But most importantly, there's a paper out three months ago where if you really want to know how bad your coronary arteries are, you must have the coronary artery calcium volume measured. Mm -hmm. And they showed that that's a great predictor. If you have very advanced coronary artery calcium accumulation, you're at six-fold increased risk of a heart attack, which is huge. There was no difference between the cholesterol levels mm -hmm. in anyone with these different calcium scores. So therefore, the cholesterol does not predict how bad your coronary arteries are. And that's what we're told. We're told that the calcium in your arteries, which is damaging them, is predicted by the cholesterol. It's not. It's completely Now, we know that there's LDL yeah. and HDL. Yeah. HDL is a bad cholesterol and LDL is a good cholesterol. Now, you are saying to us, it doesn't matter. No, it does matter. But it's the LDL small particles. You see, in the LDL, which we call the bad cholesterol, we have a good bad and a bad bad. Mm. But they don't tell you that. So the good bad is the big fluffy LDL particles, which you get when you eat a high-fat diet. So the, you say LDL is, develop, is still divided into, into, into small, medium, and yeah. large. And, and it is the small part of the LDL that is the bad cholesterol. That's Not bad all one. LDL exactly. is bad. That's the bad, bad cholesterol. And we don't measure it. Why? because the statins don't impact on it. Oh, no. Yeah. I'm going to suggest that anybody who's listening, including my own mom, who is on some statin, they must stop taking those drugs. I'm going to suggest mm. that we start measuring and doing the correct testing. So we must check the LDL and check no. the small, small particle LDL, no? So we don't have the capacity in South Africa to look at particle size and number. So when we're doing our standard cholesterol profile where you fast overnight and you go and do a cholesterol profile, we're measuring a concentration. And that doesn't tell you anything. That just tells you how much cholesterol, what number of cholesterol particles you've got in the blood. It doesn't tell you the risk. In the US, you're able to do the advanced testing. The two tests that we can do here, 
that most cardiologists, 90% of GPs do not even know, is called an apolipoprotein A and an apolipoprotein B. Mm. Now those tests are simple to do, they're on the standard blood forms, and if you add that on, that will tell you whether you've got a large particle which is harmless and generally a lower number, or whether you've got the smaller particle and a higher number. And if you've got the smaller LDL particle and a higher number of it, then you're at risk. But it doesn't matter what your LDL number is. Sure. So you are saying this information is not brought to the fore because the statins are not effective on that. What is effective then on the small particle? Probably niacin is the only drug that seems to have some role, but it's quite a tough drug to take. Would exercise affect it? I'm not sure. Probably you yeah, do need to look at, at what you, how much, what the fat, where the fat's coming from. Diet affects yeah. it. Now, you are saying, uh, and I'm quoting here uh, Dr. Sheham, who's one of the people that he said, to fully understand the disease, the doctor needs to first develop that condition and then learn to live with it. Now, that was in your case. You, you, you lived with, with, with obesity. You lived with pre-diabetes. I'm not sure whether you had diabetes. I have type 2 diabetes, but, yeah. but, but, but it is only when you started dealing with that condition that you are able to be the disciple that you are of the low, 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 low carbohydrate. Yeah. And so, so, so I've got extreme insulin resistance, and I know exactly what a high carbohydrate does to me. Mm. It just pushes my glucose completely out of control. And exercise was useless. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't Absolutely. It doesn't make any difference. It's so all those people who are insulin resistant out there, they must never try and rely on exercise exercise alone at no, least. It won't. They're but, until they change their diet, yeah. they're not going to lose But I weight. can tell you on a high, on a high fat diet, the, the glucose, my glucose control improves dramatically with it each day's exercise. It drops about half a millimole of, me, of okay. glucose, which is huge. Yeah, so, for, I, <coughs> so it's very important. Now for anybody who might not have the money to buy this book or might, is not inclined to read, but they want to follow this uh, Nox diet, how would you summarize what the essential features of this diet are all about? Firstly, it's eating, eating real food. Food where the ingredient is the food itself, where you don't have to read a list of ingredients. So if you have to pick up a package and read a list of ingredients, it's That's probably not a real food. Sure. But if you pick up a cabbage, hey, 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 hey. or you're That's picking true. up tripe, mm. you're eating a real food. Mm. So that's simple. For many people in Africa, it, it is going back to eating traditional foods. So it is eating from the, the animal from the head to the tail. It's eating the trotters, it's eating the brain, it's eating tripe, it's eating organs. Um, it's, it's making use of the full animal. What it, must you avoid according to the Noakes diet? Refined carbohydrates particularly, but the total carbohydrates. So, so the key is that you need to cut your carbohydrate intake in proportion to your level of insulin resistance. So I eat 25 grams of carbohydrate a day, which is equivalent to one apple, and that's it. So two apples a day would completely destroy my health mm. in the long term, and people don't realize it. It's absolutely, the margins are very fine. Mm. We saw Billy Tosh there. Now, Billy Tosh also 25 grams a day. If we put him on 75 grams, he will put on 10 kilograms. Seriously, yeah. that, that big boy was, he will put was on, on the and aeroplane. If, yeah. if we get him up to 100 grams of mm. carbohydrate a day, he will put on, 20 or 30 kilograms. And that's how many apples? I that, mean, yeah, that's four, four apples. That's, that's all? It. That's all. Yeah. That's it. And yeah. he's also got a sugar addiction, which he acknowledges. And so he may not touch sugar. But again. it's not a no-carbohydrate yeah. diet. Yeah. So you still get carbohydrate from salad, yeah. vegetables, yeah. Mm. Uh, and very this occasional fruit. So vegetables and salad is your source of carbohydrate. But, but Prof, you say the main culprit here and what your diet actually impacts on is appetite. Because you said simple sugars and high, carb and high carbohydrate content, all it does is that yeah. it comes in, insulin shoots up, and then you are, you are hungry in no time. So how do you ensure that you keep that appetite down? By just not eating carbohydrate. Once you get your carbohydrates below a certain amount, you'll find your appetite disappears. And it's just amazing and because your, your relationship to food changes completely. I do not think about food at all during the day. If I go, I have breakfast, I, I know what I'm going to eat, and then I won't worry about food again till, till dinner. And, and that's astonishing. I don't have to worry. So I'm sitting here at this time of day. 
I'm not worried when, if I'm going to get food in the next hour or two hours or three hours mm -hmm. or four hours. It absolutely doesn't matter. If I had to run a marathon in the next hour or two, it would be fine. I would just go ahead and do it. I wouldn't worry about that I hadn't eaten for 24 hours because it's totally irrelevant because I've got all the energy in my body, but now I can access it. Because when you're eating carbohydrates, you secrete insulin and you lock the fat in the cells. And that's another reason. So you can never always, you're burning on this, this jet fuel, which is carbohydrate. And you can never get to the stores of, carb, of fat, which are there, which give you this long, slow burn. I, th I think there are a lot of people who don't have a problem in restricting simple and highly refined sugars, who don't have a problem with a processed food. Uh, but they have a problem with adding fat mm. into their diet, which is yes. what you two guys yeah. Yeah. are promoting. Now, now, what have you got against those people? Because people are saying, don't add fat because fat is going to cause you problems. Fat is going to increase your cholesterol. Fat is going to clog your blood vessel. Now, you are saying you need fat. Now, why do you think fat is important in the diet? Well, firstly, people have got to get over the fear of fat mm. because they still it's thinking... It's not tasty for starters. I mean, on its yeah. own. Now, I hear you guys say you remove fat from the food. Mm. It's, it's not tasty. It but taste. if I have a piece of a chop, yeah. I will eat everything but the fat. Yeah. But the fear of fat is because people think fat is going to make them drop dead from a, from a heart attack or a stroke. Mm. So that's the first problem, is that we've got to undo that, that, that myth. Yeah. The, the second thing is that fat is one of the key ways to improve your risk for heart disease. I see. If you want to improve your cholesterol and those apolipoproteins that I spoke about, you need fat. Mm. So you do need so? fat in your diet. Okay. You need fat for your brain, for your memory. You need fat for your testosterone and your estrogen. You need fat for your immune system. If you are on a low carbohydrate and a low fat diet, you are essentially eating protein and that is a starvation type of diet. I see. So that, but that you also need protein to suppress your appetite, don't you, Prof? Yeah, mm. absolutely. But as Gail says, there are, there are, you need a certain amount of protein, you need a certain amount of fat, but you need absolutely zero carbohydrate. So what we're doing, we're taking a nutrient which we don't need, and it's pushing out the foods we really need. The high protein, the high fat foods are getting thrown out. And, and, and it's starting at a young age. And I can tell you, my theory would be that the increase in mental disorders amongst children is because at critical eras of the first two years of their lives, mm -hmm. they don't get enough fat. And if you don't have fat and protein in your diet, you cannot de develop all the parts of your brain. And you just miss a few but, but few critical parts and you're autistic or you've got ADHD or whatever. And it's very surprising that ADHD and autism seems to have increased dramatically since the 1977 guidelines. Why? Because the mothers are feeding the children muesli and, and grains from the age of six months instead of what they really need, which is a high protein, high fat diet because you can't build brains without it. Tell us about changes in the medical world. We'll continue our discussion on the Nox diet after the break. Welcome back, Honey. So, such a lot of people come from Salad that's even on a body trans house call or SABC2. And today, we're demystifying the Nogs diet. So, in summary, Prof, lest we forget, you are saying today it is quite critical for individuals to know if they are carbohydrate resistant or not. And where Dr. Ashford has already given us a sense of, of what some of those things that might begin to make you suspect that you might be carbohydrate resistant. One of them is if you have a weight around your midri, if you, if you have cravings, if you get hungry after eating just one or two hours before and stuff like that. But you could go on to, to do certain blood tests to actually you know, diagnose it. And the fasting blood sugar, fasting insulin would be those things that will change a little bit earlier. And of course, your HbA1c, which is a test that you can do in the blood, can also go on to confirm that. Now, once you have identified yourself to be carbohydrate resistant, there are certain ways in which you must modify your diet. Yeah. And just summarize it one more time, lest you forget. Simply, you now need to cut the carbohydrates and restrict the amount of carbohydrate you're taking. 
So no, most people probably in South Africa are eating between 300 and 400 grams of carbohydrate a day, which is completely unnecessary. Even if you're an elite athlete doing the Tour de France, you only need 200 grams. Mm -hmm. And that's relatively little compared to what we're eating. So we get people under 200 grams to start with. And depending how sick you are, we go right down to 25 grams. So okay, just to, just to be practical, 200 grams of carbohydrate, what, what would that mean? What, what, what would that mean? That mean, mean gives you a couple of slices of bread yeah. and Two a, slices some fruit. It's, it's about five, five slices. Yeah. Five, five slices, slices yeah. of bread. Okay. Spread out throughout the day? Yeah, that's, that's the whole day. Okay. But remember, that's all you can have. You can't have anything else, in a fruit and veg, as well as that. Okay. So you, one has to find which foods have a lot of carbohydrate and restrict them. So it's pasta, rice, bread, potatoes. They have to go immediately. Okay. And so what are those things? So pasta must go, rice yeah. must go, porridge potatoes. must go. Porridge, potatoes. Uh, yeah. uh, must go. <laughs> and, 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 and what else? Chips must go. Chips That's gone now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely okay. gone. Potatoes? Potatoes gone as well, unfortunately. But Any we, type of potato? Yeah, well, sweet potato is all right. Ah, but what the, is the difference between sweet potato and normal potato? Now, let, let's talk about that. Oh, my that. goodness. There are people who will tell you that sweet potato is much better, but how is it better? Because potato is a potato. And it is to do with the carbohydrate content of I it. See. And I think also to do with the digestibility yeah, the of fiber. it. Okay. There's um, more fiber in the, yeah. in the sweet potatoes. So it's like comparing a pumpkin and a butternut. I see. Um, pumpkin has less carbohydrate than butternut. Yeah. But also to do the sweet potato has got less carbohydrate than a potato. And definitely no sugar in your tea. Yeah, that's the key. So, so unless you get rid of the sugar and the sweet taste, you may not survive on this diet. You have to change your diet completely to looking for fat. And that's the key. What happened when sugar was introduced into the diet across the world in, after 1900 was we, we lost the natural desire to eat fat. Nice. You see, if, Victor, if we went back 300 years ago, do you know what your great, great, great ancestors were eating. They were eating rhinoceros, elephant, and hippopotamus. Mm. And that's in the record. How did they catch these enormous animals? We don't know. Mm. But you look around the world, whichever, any hunter population, that's what they were eating. They were at looking for the fattest animals. Humans have a desire to eat fat. And what we've done is we've taken the fat out and we've replaced it with sugar. And the people noticed that immediately. Sugar came in, people became less interested in eating fat because they just wanted the sugar. How come are the French so healthy? I mean, they eat, uh, they eat all afternoon. I mean, uh, you go to Paris, I mean, all they do is eat. If you sit down with them, it's a five, six, seven, eight course meal, and they remain thin and healthy. And I don't think they die so much from heart attacks. How do they get it right? Well, it's known as the French paradox. They have the lowest rate of, of heart disease in Europe, and yet they eat the most saturated fat. The, the so-called traditionally known bad fat. And they also have a lot of smokers. But I think they have a totally different culture of eating. They, they drink red wine daily. They also still have the very artisanal way of producing bread. It isn't mass produced. It's produced in the slow old processes and using natural yeasts. Um, they eat small amounts. They eat butter. They do not use these industrial seed oils. So when they make their bread, it is made with uh, natural animal oils, and they put butter on their bread. And maybe they're not, they're, they're not carbohydrate resistant, most of them. That's also true, but yeah. they also eat from the farm. So yeah. they have these markets, and they will go to the market every mm. two or three days, which is not what we do. Speaking of alcohol, what, what is the role of alcohol in, in, manage, in weight management? And is it part of the Noakes diet by any chance? Unfortunately, it's not. We decreed mm. it's it's off limits <laughs> in the second edition. You got the first edition, it mm. was still allowed. But you're still, you're still, yeah, yeah. But we since declared it off but limits. But of all the alcohol groups, which ones, if, if, if and I know you won't, you won't say it on national television, I won't say which one would you allow, but which one would be the worst culprit from kombuchi to champagne to red wine to, to, to white wine to whiskey to brandy? Which one would you say is the worst culprit? Well, I would say something like kombuchi is mm. probably one of the better because it, it's got the yeasts and it's got the slow brood, so it's yeah. got the fermentation yeah. process. So from that point, you might get some of the health benefits, the probiotic okay. nature. But from the carb, it's extremely high in carbohydrate. The, the beers, the one good thing about our beers in South Africa is it's our only source of non-genetically modified maize. But beer is pure carbohydrate. Okay. So it's very high carbohydrate. 
things like a glass of champagne or a glass of wine is ten tends to be between two and four grams of carbohydrate. Mm. So the drier the wine, the less carbohydrate. I see. Red wine has got the antioxidants, so it may have some benefit in from that point In moderate amounts, it does have some benefit. Yes. Now, now, now it, it, and these gimmicks, I mean, you go into the shops, you find them, there's a diabetic ice cream, and there's a low sugar uh, cool drink, and uh, there's a low sugar uh, this, and uh, they're all, uh, they're, they're all yeah. processed foods. You don't want yeah. them. We don't eat processed foods. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. But some of the drinks that are supposed to be low carbohydrate or they, zero they, they've carbohydrate. Still, oh, they've got some other sweetener in them, an artificial yes. sweetener, which yeah. is con keeps you looking for sweet, searching yeah. for sweetness. The, prob the problem with sweetness is that it, it might not be introducing a calorie into your gut, but it is still fooling the brain and telling you that there's something sweet coming in. So your brain is still telling your gut and you still release insulin. I see. And oh. so you still get the this same insulin surge, you're just not getting the calorie. But the problem is that you want to get rid of your insulin so that you can reduce your insulin resistance. So the sweetness are still a problem. Mm. So you say anybody who's a sweet tooth do have carbohydrate resistance after all? Uh, may well do, yeah, mm -hmm. and they, it, to, to long, for their long-term health, unfortunately, you have to get rid of it in the long term. And you're saying anything that is low-fat in your diet, it does not, it's got no room in your diet. None at all, because it, it's, it, it is it's taboo. in unhealthy, it must be. And anything out. that is supposed to be low-sugar this or no sugar this is just a gimmick, it's just, just, a just a gimmick, dangerous. Yeah, exactly correct. And fruit, do you allow fruit to be eaten at any uh, level? We only, really, berries are acceptable because they're low in carbohydrate, but they're high in nutrients. I see. But the other, food, the other fruits are a sweet, and you must have, they're a treat. You can, may eat them occasionally, but that's but very infrequent. So if I know what's good for me, I must stop eating bananas, I must stop eating peaches. It doesn't yeah. matter whether they are processed they, in a tin or they're You might as well just take tree. a bag of glucose and eat it like that, because it's exactly <sighs> the same response. We'll run up our discussion on the dog's diet when we return. to close this. You're watching Politos House Call here on SABC2 and welcome back. Samno Mushutel Lachan, I've been up. Dr. Ashford, can you just give us a summary? I know there are a few things that we didn't have enough time to cover. Mm. I think what I would stress is when we talk about dropping your carbohydrates and increasing your fat, the fat is very particular. It's got to be natural fat, fat from animal, fat from dairy, fat from natural sources like fish. The fat we don't want you to be eating is industrial fats, and that's fats like canola oil, sunflower oil, where they have to be extracted through unnatural processes. These are unstable, very, very dangerous fats, okay. despite having the heart seal. Mm. Even trans, if they have a heart seal. Trans fats are what it becomes. And trans fats are universally accepted to be the kind of fats that are toxic to the heart and, they're very and the brain. Absolutely. Prof, your QS. It's taken me 65 years to learn that 85% of medical ill health is related to nutrition. And unless you sort your nutrition out, you will not sort out your chronic diseases. And this you must do by avoiding simple sugars. If you are insulin resistant, absolutely. So it's important for all of us to know if you are insulin resistant, because if we are, there are certain things yeah. that we need to avoid, and there are certain things that we need to up, which is fat in our diet, and a little bit of protein, so that we are able to deal with the insulin resistance, and we can rid ourselves of obesity and everything else that comes with obesity. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashworth. That was to you, the no side. If you know, the results are there for everybody to see. Try it. It is not dangerous at least, and you've seen evidence that people have lost weight and they've improved their lives by using the nose side. I, for one, promote it. So just since you know who Muji, Mr. Slavos, say how we are matter. Hold on, number one, but see, but hassle, but cut me, just because general man, okay, but no name. Thank you, Hamwe. Thank you, Habidi. Thank you, Harar. Now, the man get job. Is it the private friends of all the candidates in the Gaja? We'll be back next Saturday with another interactive show. So don't miss it here on SBC2 at 8:30 in the morning. Arko pa ng hatay, take it with you. Tato Haile Amrena.
Thanks for joining us today. And for me, Dr. Victor Ramuresi Ramatisen. Yeah, how are you? Kim Ramakwa Pan. Kim Namanesa. Kim Tangwamleza. You take care.